That was awesome. All right. So look, I'm here today to talk about this guy, Nate Walkingshaw. No, no, it's not Nate. It's just a hacker. So <laughs> we're going to talk about hackers because I want to talk a lot about security, and you can't sort of talk about security without talking about hackers. And what I really want to do today is sort of do a little bit of a history, right? So where have we come from? What does security and hacking look like today? And where are we going in the future? Because this is where it gets really interesting. And I thought, look, before I do this, we've got to understand the adversary, right? So we've got to understand who are these hackers. So I went out and I searched for hackers to help everybody understand who we're talking about. Now, do you see any trends here with the hackers? OK, they all look like Nate is one thing. Uh, <laughs> They also, very, very much, they like green. I don't know if you notice this. It happens all the time. They're into binary as well. Hackers are very big in binary, which is kind of important if you're going to do anything with a computer system. Now, the thing is, is that we do see this imagery over and over again. So we see it in the likes of the press. And the reason we see imagery like this is because it creates like an emotional reaction, because it's scary. So people see it, and they go, wow, this, this guy looks pretty bad. We've got to get in here and read the story. Now, we see this from the press. We also see it from security companies. Because security companies want to scare you enough so that you buy their security things. Now, let me give you an example of that. There's a product called Cujo. Now, Cujo is a product you buy, you put it in your home, no more hackers. It's awesome. Now, they, they want to try and give you a bit of an idea about who you're trying to protect your things from. So they have a little video clip here. You may not know it, but you've probably already been hacked. Thousands of hacking attacks occur each day. Now, how do we know this guy's a hacker? Hoodie, green screen, great, everyone's learning, good. So, this is the way they represent the product. And I saw this a while ago, and I thought that this is actually really fascinating. Because when I look at what he is doing, it, it's a little bit unfamiliar, and I was particularly interested in sort of the corner of the screen, because it looks like he's hacking in a browser. And I thought, I've got to figure this out. I've got to figure out, how does this guy manage to hack in the browser? So I went to Google, searched around, and I figured it out. And I'm going to share this with you, because this is something you can take home and amaze your friends and family. What you do is you go to a website called hackertyper.net. And when you get there, you just start bashing the keyboard. And as you bash, it hacks, in green, of course. Honestly, like, this is all it is. So <laughs> companies are using things like Hacker Typer in order to convince you that you need to buy security things. Now, all of this, of course, gets back to the whole thing about how should we actually secure our things. And this is where I want to sort of start looking back a little bit. So we'll start here. This is MIT in the 60s. And this is their compatible time sharing system. Now, the reason I'm showing this is that this is considered to be the first implementation of a password on a computer. Now, when we say computer, this is not really a PC. It's like a room. The whole room is the computer. And when you think about who the threat actors were, so these are the adversaries. These are the people with the hoodies trying to break into your things. So who were the threat actors trying to get access to people's accounts in this first ever password system? Well, first of all, it's someone who has physical access. So someone would have to get into the room. So when you consider that against today's threat actors, which is basically anyone who can connect to the internet for most systems, this was very different. The other thing is, in terms of people creating passwords, think about the choices you had in the 60s. You weren't publishing your dog's name on Facebook. So you could use your dog's name as a password. You weren't publishing your birth date on Twitter and Skype and everywhere else it appears. You could use your birth date. People wouldn't know. And that same basic methodology that we had in the 60s, username and password, and then you just match the strings when you log on, still prevails through to today with very, very different threat actors. Now, we'll fast forward a little bit. We'll go forward a couple of decades into the 80s. Now, in the 80s, we started getting computers in the home. Like, we actually started getting PCs. And this particular one is called a Prestel. And the Prestel would actually connect over the phone line to a central service. And there's a little video clip here about how that worked. 
and I want to show you this. The Prestel computer is now asking me to enter my own personal password, which I have now done. <laughs> let's, just, just in case you didn't get that, let's like slow-mo, zoom and enhance and see this again. What is the problem with this picture? It's, it's exactly the same problem we have today, which is people choose terrible passwords. And, and this is the challenge that we have, right? Because people are thinking, well, it's got to be something I remember, so I know I can reuse it and I can go and log on to the thing again. And really, all that's changing is people are changing from 1, 2, 3, 4 to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or whatever the minimum criteria is. But again, even back then, Prestel had a total of 90,000 users. So 90,000 users is a pretty small, finite set of people. But then you fast forward into the 90s, and as we get into the 90s, we're starting to get websites. And we're getting dozens of them originally, and then we got a lot more. But the websites are now starting to say, look, if we've got all of these things out there that anyone anywhere can log into, we need to start making passwords more complex. So that there's a bit of footage here from a gentleman trying to create a complex password on a website. And the website says, look, you've got to have a lowercase character, you've got to have an uppercase character, you've got to have a number, a non-alphanumeric character. You also need to make it long enough, and you're not allowed to use the password on any other website anywhere. And we were making passwords extremely difficult for people to use. And have we not all been there? Come on. So. They, they have all of these rules about how you've got to create passwords. So what you end up doing is you create passwords like this. This is a good password, right? It has uppercase, lowercase, number, non-alphanumeric characters. It's 15 characters long, too. So this like ticks all the boxes. And any one of you could go to your place of work and create this password. It would pass all the required rules. Now, if you do that, let's say you're going to do this tomorrow. Don't use this one. I've shown it to you now. You're going to create it tomorrow. What's going to happen in 90 days from now? Your organization is going to say, a hacker might have got your password. You've got to change it. 90-day rotation cycle. So what do you do 90 days later? Right? <laughs> you all do this. I know, because I've seen your passwords. Trust me. And then another 90 days goes past. And, and what we're actually doing here is this is just humans using our brains to circumvent the technology in very ingenious ways. And then another 90 days goes. And again. And there's a neat trick that all of you can do with your passwords, which is you take the number, you divide it by four, that's how many years you've been working at the company. It's very handy, just in case you ever forget. So that the point here is that there is a social component to security which is often missed in the mathematics that demand that we have things like complex passwords and that we rotate them and we do all these other sorts of things. And, and the way this is changing now is we're starting to recognize human behavior in the way we do security. And a good example of this is the National Cybersecurity Center in the UK, the NCSC. And recently, the NCSC put out a bunch of guidance about how we should do things like passwords. And they said, look, you really should only ask the user to change their password on indication of suspicion of compromise. So what they're saying here is, is rather than saying, look, every 90 days, just in case something went wrong, and remember, it could have gone wrong like 89 days ago as well. So rather than doing that, let's wait until we see if there is something wrong. And then we have all of these other mitigating controls on top of that as well. Now, incidentally, NIST in the US as well says the same thing. Very few organizations are dropping that 90-day rotation cycle yet. Now, when you see all this and you go, passwords are painful, right? Like, when are we going to actually get rid of them? And I get asked this all the time. People are like, what is going to be the thing that kills passwords? So, for example, last week we saw Apple pop up and they, they did their iPhone 10 launch. And we got Face ID. So now you'll just be able to look at your phone, the thing will unlock, everybody's happy, won't need passwords anymore, right? So here's what will happen if you buy an iPhone 10. 
you'll get the iPhone 10, you'll take it out of the box, you'll connect it to the Wi-Fi. The very next thing it will ask you to do is enter your Apple ID and your password. All right, so the password's still there. The next thing that will happen is it'll say, you need to create a passcode because the passcode is the fallback position for when the biometrics fails. We know this because we've had Touch ID on iPhone and biometrics on all sorts of other devices for ages as well. And really, the insight here is that we are not getting rid of passwords. All we're doing is changing the frequency with which we need to use them. Now, I actually really like the idea of Apple's Touch ID, Face ID, and the other companies that do a good job of biometrics. The reason I like it so much is it makes it easy for people to be secure. It's very sort of secure by default in many ways. And this is how we're seeing technology change and security change. We're seeing things secure straight out of the box. So here's a really good example of that. This is WhatsApp. And this is my wife, Kylie, organizing the Father's Day sports afternoon for my son's year two group. And yeah, this is nice, they're chatting backwards and forwards, they're blowing kisses at each other, it's all very friendly. But in the background, what's happening is this. Hack it, no, it's not hacking. <laughs> not everything green is hacking. This is encryption. But it's a very, very special kind of encryption. It's end-to-end -end encryption. And what it means is, is that as Kylie sends this message, it gets encrypted on her phone, it goes through the internet into WhatsApp servers, still encrypted, doesn't get decrypted all the way through to the other mother's phones, and then it gets decrypted on that end. And it means that if you're, say, the NSA, you can't get access to the messages. You can't get them on the wire because they're encrypted. You also can't compel WhatsApp. So the feds can't go along to WhatsApp and sort of say, hey, we believe there's a dodgeball situation. We'd like information on it. WhatsApp doesn't have it because it is encrypted all the way. Now, this happens automatically, and what it means is, is that whether you are a mother organizing a son's Father's Day thing, because fathers are not real good at organizing this stuff, or whether you're someone who has evil intentions, you get the same level of security all the time. Now, that creates another problem. Now, I don't know if in America you ever make fun of your politicians. Why are you laughing? <laughs> in Australia, we do, not just of yours, but of ours as well. <laughs> and <laughs> this is our Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull. And Malcolm, he held this press conference, this was only a few weeks ago, with the Australian Federal Police. And he, he said, look, we're very worried that evil people can use WhatsApp and other things like this to plan evil things and we can't see the messaging. And he's right, it's a hard problem. And there's a lot of talk about do we backdoor encryption, do we compel device providers to have some sort of mechanism for the authorities to get in there. And there was a journalist in the audience and the journalist said, Malcolm, encryption ultimately is mathematics. This is all it is. How are you going to circumvent the laws of mathematics. And here's his answer. Uh, the laws of mathematics are, are uh, very commendable, but the only law that applies in Australia is the law of Australia. We have so much material, don't we, of politicians? <laughs> and th the thing about this is, it's almost like saying, the laws of gravity are very commendable, but because we have so many drop bear attacks, we're going to rule it out, and only the law of Australia... Look, it just doesn't work. That's not the way the technology works. And what this is really reminding us of is that technology and security are moving at such a rapid pace that governments and lawmakers and law enforcement, the people who we want to keep us safe, are having trouble keeping up. Now, there's no better example of how quickly technology and security is changing than IoT. Now, let me talk through the magic of what is happening here. Let's imagine you have a dog, and you go to work each day, and the dog gets lonely. So what you do is you buy a Furbo, so that's what's sitting on the desk there. Now, when you get to work, you can pull out your phone, open up the Furbo app, and you can look at the dog, because the dog is there waiting in front of the Furbo. Now, as the dog is watching the Furbo, you can start catapulting dog food at the dog, and you're watching it through the camera. Now, 
The Furbo also has a microphone in it. So the dog can talk to the Furbo and let you know that you should stop whatever it is you're doing at work and start catapulting dog food. So, so the Furbo is a listening device that you put in your home that has a video camera that broadcasts it publicly. And hopefully only you can see it. But the problem with IoT is that there are so many precedents of times that other people can see your things. Which brings me to this. Has anyone got one of these? No, because you're smart, that's why. So, so this is clearly a, uh, a message you can hug. Now, let us talk through this. These are called cloud pets. Let's imagine a little unicorn. Family goes out, buys a little unicorn for their daughter. Now, the reason why the daughter has the little unicorn, which is an IoT unicorn, is so that she can speak to mum, because mum works late. So mum's in the office late, and mum, rather than using the phone, because phone's boring, mum wants to talk to the little girl, so she records a message into her app. The message goes up into this magical thing most parents don't understand, we call it the cloud, up into the cloud, and then down into dad's phone, and then dad's phone will Bluetooth to the little unicorn, light on the unicorn will flash, the little girl can hear the message. It's all very cute, right? Now, imagine this, little girl's in her bed, wants to send a message back to mum. She can record into the unicorn because the unicorn is a listening device that you put in your child's bed. How could this possibly go wrong? Records the message over to dad's phone, back to the cloud, down to mum. Now, earlier this year, it turned out that cloud pets were putting their data in a MongoDB, publicly facing, with no password. So, of course, people found it. They used services like Shodan to search the Internet of Things and find exposed servers. So hackers found it. They deleted all the data, left a ransom message. Give us Bitcoin, and you'll get your data back. But because it was a publicly facing open MongoDB, other hackers came along and changed the Bitcoin address to their own. <laughs> and, and this happened a total of three times, people going and owning the system and putting their own Bitcoin address in there. And that was bad. And, th and then it got even worse because a guy at a security company in the UK discovered that the cloud pets have no auth on the Bluetooth device. So he actually wrangled up a little model here where he said, let's do this, I'm going to create a little app where I can drive past the little girl's home and then I can connect to the unicorn and I can start doing things like making the light on the unicorn flash because there's no auth. I can also record messages. I can send the message to the unicorn, and whilst that little girl is lying there in her bed... Exterminate! Annihilate! Destroy! And this is like a lifetime of nightmares for a kid, right? <laughs> so, so what we're actually seeing here is, is two different vulnerable aspects of IoT. We're seeing data, the likes of which we've never had before, collected, stored in the cloud, and put at risk but we're also seeing the devices themselves and control of the devices handed over to attackers, which leads us to this one. Now, as you can clearly see, <laughs> this one here is a connected toilet. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> now, this is all in Japanese, and I don't speak any Japanese, so I've had to try and figure out the way this thing works. And what is evident from this is, first of all, it will Bluetooth over to the toilet, and right about now, you might be looking at this going, why would you do that? <laughs> like, what would you actually do with it? So I went and found images from the companion app. And we're going to walk through these together. So the first one, first one is some sort of a splash screen. Nothing? Ah, oh, come on. The second one, as best I can tell, is event-driven data of some nature. And the third one, and I kid you not, I have not made this up, this is not photoshopped, is a music player, and it has the toilet playing I Can't Get No Satisfaction. <laughs> and I was showing this particular example to people in talk several years ago, and I said, look, this is all a, like it's a brave new future, this is great. What's going to happen when it goes wrong? So what if there's a vulnerability? And there was a vulnerability, and a security advisory had to be released saying that attackers could cause the unit to unexpectedly activate Badaya or AirDrive functions, causing discomfort or distress. 
And the, the, the thing is, this is where we are now going. This is the future of security in IoT, where we have to prepare for intrusions in all sorts of places we have never even expected. <laughs> and on that horrifying note, thank you very much. <laughs>